I want to introduce you to Dr. Rashad Shabazz, who will be presenting Biography of a Sound, Prince, Place, and the Hidden History of the Minneapolis Sound, and then we'll have some Q&A. Dr. Rashad Shabazz's academic expertise brings together human geography, Black cultural studies, gender studies, and critical prison studies. His research explores how race, sexuality, and gender are informed by geography. His most recent work, Spatializing Blackness, published by the University of Illinois Press 2015, examines how carceral power within the geographies of Black Chicagoans shaped urban planning, housing policy, policing practices, gang formation, high incarceration rates, masculinity, and health. Dr. Shabazz is currently working on two projects. The first examines how Black people use public spaces to negotiate and perform race, gender, and sexual identity, as well as to express political or cultural identity. And the second project uncovers the role Black musicians in Minneapolis played in giving rise to the Minneapolis sound. He'll be presenting and discussing the second project with us today. So please join me in silently welcoming Dr. Shabazz. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Rashad, and please feel free um, to share your screen. I think I am enabling that right now, um, if it wasn't already enabled. Right. Let's see. There we go, should be. Yes, yes, okay, perfect. Uh, so first, I uh, wanna say uh, thank you very much, Liz, for allowing me to be here. Thank you for organizing this. And I'm really excited to um, share this research with you all. Um, I've been working on it diligently for the last few years. Um, I began this research before Prince died. I started it in the fall of 2014 uh, as my second book project. It really began as a kind of, um, you know, fan, somewhat of a fan project. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big Prince fan, and, you know, I'll talk about that at some point in time in the talk, but I'm a, you know, really big Prince fan. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to utilize the tools and the techniques and the skill set that I developed in doing spatializing blackness and put it towards something um, that wasn't as emotionally heavy because spatializing blackness was a difficult book to write. So I started this project. And then when Prince died in 2016, um, you know, being, you know, really devastated by his loss, um, but also having done all this research, I really dedicated, uh, sort of threw all of my energy into this. So um, Biography of a Sound, let me, I'll tell you a little bit about the project so you'll get a sense of the talk. Biography of Sound is actually made up of two projects uh, together. One is um, a, a, a historical geography that I'm writing uh, of the city and of the sound. And that's what a lot of uh, the talk will be about today, that, that historical geography, you know, how it functions, um, what, it, what it sounds like uh, and, the, and what it reveals. The second is that I'm doing a, a virtual uh, reality um, uh, experience where I will essentially be gathering up a lot of the data that I have accumulated over the years, the images, um, the, the sounds, the maps, the, you know, the, the tons of things that I've gathered. And I'm going to have them, um, I'm, gonna, a lot, uh, I'm, I'm going to utilize the, the expertise and labor of a digital animator to recreate portions of the city that will you know, effectively become alive against the backdrop of the historical narrative that I sketch in the book. So they're, they're really kind of hand in hand you know, the book is a, is a very uh, particular project, whereas the, the VR is something that um, I'm hoping to utilize as a way to get people interested in maybe reading the book or just being interested uh, in, the, in the history of the history and the geography of the Minneapolis South. So with that, I have, um, I'm going to get into the bulk of my talk. And if we have enough time, I'm just going to show you my little beta demo uh, of the, the VR project. You don't have to have goggles. I'll just you know, show it to you uh, just by sharing my screen. But uh, we are going to now start with um, the, the, main, uh, the main course, if you will, which is the, uh, the presentation. So, you know, uh, geography in the Minneapolis Sound. So if you don't know much about Prince, uh, shame on you. No, I'm just joking. Uh, if you don't know much about Prince, don't worry, uh, because you actually know more about Prince than you think you do. And I'll demonstrate that in the course of the talk. Um, 
And if you do, this is a way to really have a much deeper understanding. Um, so we'll start with the, the, the beginning, which is always the best place to begin. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna make sure I'm doing this right. Uh, I can just do that, okay. So the Minneapolis sound, you know, other than the fact that I really like Prince's music, that I live there, that they have a really rich, interesting musical history. Why is, you know, why does this matter? You know, and, that, and that's important, right? I don't want you all just to be here just because I think it's hella cool. You know, you know I, I want you to be here because it, it offers something important. So uh, I'm a geographer and what I do is I study how phenomena, race, gender, uh, culture, uh, sexuality, how those things manifest themselves spatially. So this project is that. So what we're going to be doing and what I'll be talking about today is the Minneapolis sound and the geography of the city. They are intertwined, right? The, the sound of that city is a reflection of its politics, of its migratory patterns, of its educational system, uh, of its public policies. It is not just about, you know, individuals or, or one individual, you know, black kid from the city's north side, but instead it is a, it is a much broader uh, phenomenon at play. And in the course of talking about it, I'll, I'll demonstrate that. The Minneapolis Sound uh, and Prince are a way to trace the growth of the city's politics, its economy, and its culture. And the Sound of Minneapolis maps the migrations, transformation, and racial politics of the city. So, you know, like, um, you know, like like a historian might trace a kind of uh, political phenomena or a um, or how a, a literary um, a, a literary theorist might trace the kind of literary uh, technique in uh, in a piece of literature. I'm tracing sound in the city, and um, and oh, just as just as a side piece, I try to really put as many interesting, useful images. So uh, as you can see, these are some of the the most important figures of the Minneapolis Sound. Prince in the middle, Morris Day, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who are the super producers who have pretty much produced everything everybody on this call uh, at some point in time has listened to uh, the Jets, Andre Simone and others. So this project comes out of a, a body of work called geomusicology, you know, geo meaning uh, of space and place and musicology meaning the study of music. And geomusicology is the spatial or geographic study of music. And here I have this map of the sort of Western world or most of the globe, if you will, that's, that is attempting to locate the, the particular kinds of music that we see globally. And what geomusicologists do is they study the relationship between music and place. And they're, the main argument of geomusicologists is that the music that we listen to, popular music, classical, folk, what have you, is profoundly shaped by place. Right? And in the, in the corpus of this talk, I'm going to try to demonstrate how that works uh, in the form of Minneapolis. So uh, just, just to give just a, a very brief example, um, the, the, music of the, um, the, the music of New Orleans, that, you know, that gumbo we call jazz, that, that sound was, could only have been produced there. Why? Migratory patterns, the politics that had been located there, and how all of those things really got sedimented into that landscape. And the outbirth, the outgrowth of that was, was jazz. And that's why it sounds, sounded and sounds the way that it does because it came out of that place. And it has various different variations all over the world where jazz is played and, and it's attentive to those particular places, right? But, but the, the, the birthplace where it came from is, is about that location, that politics, that history, those resources and those communities that migrated there. So what is the Minneapolis sound? Well, the Minneapolis sound is, it's, it's, it's about fusion, right? And if you, if you know a little bit about music, 
you know, fusion is really about the sort of bringing together of multiple different sounds, different genres, different techniques, different kinds of chord progressions. And it's about bringing them together to produce something new in the process of bringing all these other pieces. And the Minneapolis sound, particularly as Prince gave uh, rise to it, uh, it's a fusion of funk and rock and R&B and new wave in a pop format, right? So when I say pop format, I mean the sort of three and a half minute, you know, three and a half, four minute song that has like three verses and a couple of hooks and, you know, it follows a steady pattern. That's what I mean by pop music, not necessarily popular music in that it's on Apple Music or Spotify or, you know, it's the sort of top 40, but rather popular music as, as a kind of format. Um, so these music genres that I mentioned in terms of the Minneapolis sound really as, as Prince gives expression to it are, uh, you know, rock, funk, R&B, and new wave. They were very popular in the 1970s when Prince was really coming into his own, right? These music genres were sort of, you know, really thriving in various parts of the city. Uh, and they were enabled these music genres were enabled by social, uh, by, by social forces, right? Not particular individual genius or individual ability, but rather these music genres that were really laying the groundwork for the music that Prince would produce throughout his, his career and create this new sound, they were enabled by social forces like migration, for example, right? Black people coming up from the South, Scandinavians coming in, bringing all these different sounds, all of these different ways of playing and doing music, these became really uh, fundamental to the laying of the groundwork of the Minneapolis sound. And Prince became the most well-known and most important figure in the Minneapolis sound. And the primary reason he became so important is because he created the tapestry, he created the framework by which the Minneapolis sound got its name and it gave expression to itself, which was to bring the funk, the R&B, the rock, and the new wave together, right? Rather than this sort of, you know, one genre doing this over here, one genre doing, one group doing this and that over there. What Prince was able to do was to fuse them together. And in the course of doing that, create an endless array of chord progressions, sounds, harmonic patterns, rhythms. And then when you add that with his just sheer ability, it really, uh, he is really the most important figure in the Minneapolis sound. So let's talk about how all this got started. All of this got started, the Minneapolis sound, the sound of Prince, uh, you know, all of that music that flowed out of that place and continues to flow out of that place began with a waterfall. Yeah, I know. Strange, who would think that, right? With a geological formation that, that, that emerged over millions of years, the Mississippi River where Minneapolis sits is the only place along the 2,000 mile road of the, Minneapolis, of, the, of the Mississippi River that has a waterfall. And indigenous people have been gathering at that location for, for generations because it provided them with a food source. It was an, it was an easy uh, land marker. It was also a power source. And in 1680, um, a French monk by the name of Father Louis Hennepin stumbled across the falls with his compatriots. And when he saw the falls, the secret was out. And the rest of the Western world would soon know about the falls. And he named the falls the Falls of St. Anthony. Uh, St. Anthony, St. Anthony, it was the patron patron saint of lost souls. Uh, ironically, the only person lost were Hennepin and his compatriots. Uh, nevertheless, the name stuck and the falls became known as the Falls of St. Anthony. You know, there's a lot I could go into and I'll do my best to sort of consolidate uh, in a precise way. Once, Hennepin wrote about the falls of St. Anthony and, and it was published in, in widely read manuals. The federal government and prospectors began moving into this new Northwest Territory near the, uh, near the waterfall, uh, looking, for, looking for land, uh, looking for resources, looking for wealth, uh, expanding the country as we, as we know uh, throughout the, the uh, awful histories of 
uh, colonization and westward expansion. And at the center of that, uh, in this story about the, the sound of the city, uh, was the colonization of the indigenous people who had been living there for, as I said, eons, right? And this is a uh, this is a um, an image from 1863 uh, captured uh, Sioux Indians in Fort Snelling. Uh, Fort Snelling became really the major uh, and the first uh, westward uh, uh, federal e expansion because it was the it was uh, uh, it was placed there as a kind of strategic uh, location point. Uh, for against the backdrop of fears around uh, the 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 invasion of uh, either Canadians or the British, in particular, you have to remember this is just a you know a, a not too long after the Revolutionary War. So the the uh, the fears and the anxieties uh, or the concern of of um, a British invasion were uh, ever present. So colonization of that land really led to early Minneapolis. Minneapolis springs out of that colonization. And Minneapolis was, uh, as you might imagine, or maybe, maybe not, uh, it, was a, it was a Northwestern uh, frontier town. Uh, it was largely uh, organized uh, and produced through prospectors, many of them from New England uh, and other parts of the Midwest, uh, white prospectors coming in, and then a large number of Scandinavians, particularly uh, Norwegians and the Swedish, uh, beginning to migrate in the 1860s, 70s, uh, and the 1880s. And early Minneapolis was industrially a mill town. Right, because of all of the um, uh, all of the natural resources around timber, uh, iron ore, uh, but particularly wheat, uh, Minneapolis became a mill town. So you know the cereal you had uh, this morning, which may have been from um, uh, which may have been from like Pillsbury, one of the major uh, wheat producers were founded um, in Minneapolis, and those mills functioned in that city until uh, World War I. But it was, a, uh, it was a, essentially a mill town for the first 75 years of the city's history. Here's just a, a, a map of uh, St. Anthony. So St. Anthony is uh, on the, the East Bank. So if you're looking at it, uh, it'll be on your right hand. You can see up in the top right-hand side, it says, uh, map of St. Anthony right up here. And then on the left side uh, is Minneapolis, which uh, formed just a few years ago. St. Anthony was founded in 1851. Minneapolis comes online a few years later in 1857. In the 1870s, the two towns converge uh, because of this bridge built right here that connects and conjoins the two towns and, and the, the towns um, uh, keep the name Minneapolis, the name of the falls becomes St. Anthony Falls, and Minneapolis uh, is born. But just to give you a sense of the scale, here are all of the, the mills located all throughout this, the city. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing. It was, just, it was completely a mill town for its first 75 years. And just some uh, images here to give you all a sense of of, of the uh, uh, the frontier quality uh, of the of the city in its early years. Uh, if you can see from that bottom uh, right here, you can see uh, Pillsbury. Um, so the Pillsbury uh, the, the Pillsbury family they were actually part of that migratory group who came out of New England. They're from New Hampshire. They moved there to acquire uh, land after the federal government's intervention. And, uh, theft from the indigenous population, and they built uh, Pillsbury, and it became one of the biggest mills uh, al along the banks of the Mississippi River. So we're going to now move into the 20th century and start talking a little bit about music. So that period laid the foundation for uh, the city's um, sonic history. Uh, it did it in, in a couple of ways. One, the migratory patterns. Large numbers of 
uh, New Eng folks from New England, uh, many others from um, the, the, the various parts of the Midwest, small number of blacks coming from the, from the, uh, from the South, but a large number of Scandinavian migrants, right? And that, that brings, you know, that allows people to bring not only sort of literary and artistic traditions, but it also allows them to bring uh, their songs. And by the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, these migratory populations mixed with the building of music halls, music shops, and music schools all over the city from 1850 until the turn of the century really sediments music as a kind of popular form of cultural resonance that, it, that really exists at the core of the city's identity. It becomes effectively a kind of music town where you know, European folk songs, Icelandic popular music, you know, German music, all, you know, all, of this, all of these sounds are reverberating all throughout the city and they're being played everywhere. Again, an infrastructure is built. Dance halls, music halls are built all throughout the, um, uh, the, the, the middle and the end part of the 19th century. In the early 20th century, an innovation happens in the school's music system, public school music system, that fundamentally changes the landscape for music in that city, and really it changes the, the, the direction of popular music uh, in the Western world. Thaddeus Paul Giddings is hired as the supervisor of music for the Minneapolis public school system. Um, Thaddeus, uh, Thaddeus Paul Giddings, or T.P. Giddings, is one of the uh, progenitors of music education uh, in the United States. He created Bandcamp. I'm sure you all have heard of Bandcamp. If either you've been there, you sort of know the, uh, the various cultural references around Bandcamp. He created Bandcamp. Um, he brought an innovation uh, when he signed on to be the Minneapolis, um, the director, the superintendent for the Minneapolis public school system. Um, he brought an innovation, and that innovation was to teach all of, the ch all of the children across race, age, class, and ethnic background, to teach them to read, write, and play music. Now, this had never been done before, especially not in a big city uh, school system. At this time, Minneapolis has over 200,000 people, so it is a large and growing city. He decides to do this, uh, and his innovation has, I think, one of the most important impacts that any form of public policy had on uh, music education. And what it did was it democratized music education. It taught poor kids, working class kids, uh, immigrant kids, and a large crop of black children coming up from the South who were fleeing white supremacy in places like Louisiana, it taught them how to read, write, and play music. Just to give you a sense of the impact it had, he installs this program in the Minneapolis public school system in the early 20th century before the First World War. By 1950, one in every six children in the Minneapolis school system can read music, write music, and play at least one instrument, one in every six. That kind of musical fluency and ability is just unparalleled. We've never seen anything like that in a public school system. And music also was compulsory, meaning that if you failed music, you did not matriculate onto the next grade. It's just really unbelievable, right? And it was a, it was a deep public investment where the, the school system, parents, um, and the larger Minneapolis community, through the depression, through an economic downturn around World War I, scraped and saved and created the resources to make sure their children knew how to read, write, and play music. It's really a, an incredible um, feat but the impact that it had is intergenerational. It's just one of the key texts that, um, that, he, uh, that Giddings helped to publish. This is 19, 
1916 uh, in a major key, music in the Minneapolis schools, why it's taught, how it's taught, uh, and what the results are. It was, it was first published, uh, he first published it when he was somewhere else, uh, where he was working in Illinois in, 19, in 1903, and then he kept updating it every single year, and he began to publish it uh, in Minneapolis in 1912 when he took over as the superintendent. So in the, in the 20th century, World War I, um, the mills come to a screeching halt. Uh, there's a lots of reasons for it, cheaper land, the opening of the Panama Canal, uh, expensive railroads, you know, you can ask if you want during the Q&A, but just know that uh, 75 years after uh, the, the beginning of the city, uh, uh, and in 1917, the economy in Minneapolis takes a nosedive, and against the backdrop of industrialization, the mills effectively disappear, and the city goes into an economic tailspin. This is exactly the same time that Black people are migrating from Minneapolis, from the South, into Minneapolis. Um, and, and, and Minneapolis, unlike Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, New York, and other uh, cities, Los Angeles, uh, unlike them, Minneapolis received a relatively small Black population, you know, less than 1% uh, in the early part of the 20th century. It didn't it didn't move past 1% uh, until the years after the Second World War. Um, and I'll tell you now a little bit about that community. So Black Minneapolis, or North Minneapolis, uh, is, has been the home of, um, has been a kind of the home of refugees since the beginning of the 20th century. Early 20th century, Jews began to migrate into the city uh, really quickly. North Minneapolis is here. You see there's downtown Minneapolis, uh, and here is the near north side, this period here. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, late, late 19th actually, um, European Jews began to migrate in, escaping growing fascism in Europe. Around World War I, Blacks began to move in, escaping white supremacy in the South. And these refugee communities began to sort of bond and create a kind of collective life together throughout much of the 20th century. But after the Second World War, uh, Jews began to migrate and move north of the north side to suburbs. Uh, and uh, the near north side becomes effectively Black Minneapolis by the 1950s, 1960s. That's so cool. That's, that's so cool. Um, so um, Black Minneapolis had its own thriving music scene. So check the time. It had its own thriving music scene. Uh, jazz, blues, rhythm and blues, early rock and roll was all being cultivated in that near north side community. And because the Black population was so small, 1%, it had, a different, it had a different relationship to racism, white supremacy, and white Minneapolitans. Effectively, Blacks were tolerated in Minneapolis, unlike Chicago, where there was outright hostility. Same in LA, same in, um, same in New York City, and in other cities that had large Black populations, right? White citizens in those, those communities saw Black people as a threat, and they responded to them uh, with violence and with state power. In Minneapolis, it was the scale of all of it was fundamentally different. The, large, the small Black population effectively didn't produce anxiety and fear among the white population, and they kind of just let them be. So while on the one hand, they weren't um, isolated and contained and policed and segregated with the same intensity that Black people in Chicago, for example, were. They nevertheless faced forms of segregation, but it wasn't nearly as intense. That isn't to say that racism wasn't operating in Minneapolis. It absolutely was. It, shaped, it had a profound impact on their life. The scale and the intensity of it was very different than it was in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Milwaukee, and other places. So in that Black community, there was this kind of bubble where Black life existed without the same kind of iron-handed 
white supremacy that we saw in, in other cities. And it developed its own art scene, a thriving art scene. And Prince's father and mother were part of that art scene. So Prince's father is right here, the guy on the, uh, the piano. And if you can read the, uh, the, the, uh, the band name, the Prince Rogers Trio. So Prince was named after uh, his father's band and Prince's name was Prince Rogers Nelson. So that, that kind of tolerated racism that Black Americans dealt with in uh, Minneapolis um, boiled over in the 1960s with two forms of racial unrest. The first came in 1966, uh, one of the sort of long hot summers of 66 and 67, where there was racial unrest all over the country. Newark, Detroit, Chicago, DC, Los Angeles, and the second happened in 1967, um, five days of unra racial unrest on Plymouth Avenue. Plymouth Avenue was one of the major thoroughfares through North Minneapolis, through Black Minneapolis. And it began with police brutality, a police officer, um, um, he, in, in an attempt to break up a, a scuffle between two girls, he slams them down to the ground, a, a Black boy protests, another cop uh, beats him, uh, black people mobilized on Plymouth Avenue, marching the streets the next day. The police come uh, to, to push them back. Fights, of, fights uh, between police officers and the community break out and uh, fires are set. Uh, there's open fighting in the streets and the National Guard are called in to quail or to squash the protests. Uh, this happened in the community that Prince lived in. He lived, he lived about a 10 minute walk from where the majority of this happened. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's well within the realm of possibility that he, uh, he remembered that and he, this was something that he was, uh, he, he witnessed. Uh, so this was in, um, in 67. So that music system that was installed by Thaddeus Paul Giddings, and the migration of black people into the city in the years after, between the first and the second world wars and their cultivation of their own sound, it creates this really interesting landscape where you have children across race, class, ethnic and geographic lines who have various different ways of understanding themselves and the world around them. They live in different parts of the city. Uh, they have different experiences, but they do have one commonality. They can all read, write, and play music. And music becomes this really interesting communal language that the people in the city began to speak. And you know, if I can go back earlier in the history that I've been sketching, this is something that people in the city were really doing uh, at, at, the, at the moment of its founding and its evolution over those first 75 years, right? Using music as a kind of through line, as a way of organizing themselves. So, so with the addition now of not just the love of music, not just valuing it as a social good, which they had been doing in the 19th and early 20th century, but when you now add training, and understanding and being able to play it and being able to read it and being able to write it, which effectively enables for everyone to do it. The emergence of black musicians brings an entirely different sonic force into the Minneapolis music scene. And it takes all of this music that had been circulating, you know, folk music from Europeans, early 20th century pop music, jazz standards that had been moving up the Mississippi River. And now you bring in the, the innovations of black music. What we began to see by the 1960s and 19, early 1970s is this robust sound, not just in black Minneapolis, but you began to see in various parts of the city, a robust music scene developing all over. And what black musicians learn to do is they learn to play all of the music in it, 
Why do they learn to play all of the music in it? They learn because if they want to gig, if they want to be working musicians, a la Prince's father, then they can't just play black musical standards like the blues, like jazz, and like early rhythm and blues or rock and roll. They have to be able to play jazz standards. They have to be able to play different kinds of chord formations. They have to be able to play all of the music in the city. And Prince's father was one of those music, musicians, those working musicians, who learns to play all of the music in the city. And that's where the Minneapolis sound really, really gets its legs. So I've mentioned just before um, those, those other groups. So another sound that really begins to take off during this time is Minneapolis begins to develop a, a very local independent rock scene uh, with groups like uh, the Suicide Commandos, the Replacements, and Husker Du, right? These kids are downtown in the near uh, east side of downtown. They attended the same schools that Prince did. They knew how to play. They knew how to read. They knew how to write. And what they began to do is to develop this sound, this locally based independent um, indie rock sound. And that becomes another layer. So now we have, we have, we have funk, we have rhythm and blues, we have rock being played in, in black M Minneapolis. Now in, in white Minneapolis, we have this independent rock scene that's really bubbling over. There's also a folk scene that's, that's really getting its legs, but this independent rock scene with these kinds of groups is really exploding. So then you get this genius kid, you know, who like, you know, who like Mozart just kind of seemingly comes out of nowhere. And he's dropped into this musical milieu. He's dropped into this, this kind of gumbo, if you will, of all of this music, right? His father's a musician. He grows up in North Minneapolis and Black Minneapolis, hearing the sounds of that landscape. He goes to public school. And if you know anything about Prince's biography, you know he didn't have a good relationship with his folks. So his musical training didn't come from home. It came from school. He learned from the best of the best. Uh, an interesting side note to, to uh, Prince's musical development. His high school music teacher, um, late 60s, early 70s, was the drummer for Ray Charles. Ray Charles, the progenitor of modern rhythm and blues, uh, one of the most important musicians of the 20th century, hands down. And his, mu his high school music teacher is, is Ray Charles, right? But he has this system that has been installed by Thaddeus Paul Giddings, where he's getting expert music training as as a kid in first grade, second grade, third grade, all, all the way on, right? Plus, you add the fact that Prince was just gifted. And that's just something I can't explain, you know? Beethoven just did what he was able to do and he could just do it, you know? Prince had this uh, music and sonic ability, but that music and sonic ability was cultivated. It was nurtured. He didn't just come out of nowhere. Prince was just not some, you know, uh, atom that, that, that just exploded in Minneapolis. There was all of, this, all of this music, all of this infrastructure in place. And what Prince was able to do was to take advantage of it. So let me just give you a sense of what I mean by his genius. Um, he wrote, arranged, and performed all the music on his 48 studio albums. It's just unparalleled, 48 studio albums, the most, the, the, the best musicians over the 20th century don't do a fraction of that uh, music. In addition, he put away 20,000 songs. Prince will, be, Prince will be giving two albums a year for the next century. He has that much music. It's just, it's, it's unparalleled. We've never seen anything like this really in the history of Western music. He, he stands alone. Uh, and his music was a fusion of all of those sounds of the city. It was the fusion of that indie rock scene that was happening downtown on the north side. It was a fusion of what was happening uh, in Black Minneapolis. 
It was, and it was even picking up the, the kind of folk music that was fluttering around the city. Right? And what Prince was able to do, his genes, was his ability to synthesize all of those sounds and to create an array of unifying sounds throughout his career that was really just kind of everlasting. And they were all pop geniuses, you know, Little Red Corvette, Let's Go Crazy, Nothing Compares to You. I mean, you know, we can go on and on and on. So, you know, I've been talking a lot about these communities and where this music was located. So here's a, here's a mapping of the, the Minneapolis sonic landscape. You know, by this, this goes up until about the, the, the late 1970s or early 1980s, but it's giving you a sense. So north up here, you know, black Minneapolis, lots of the, the, the black clubs. This here's downtown Minneapolis, many of the downtown clubs kind of rock and independent scene. There's a little folk music being played here as well. And then you have a smaller black community that's down here in the Southern part, uh, but because it's not as big, you have around the edges a kind of rock scene and then a more R&B and funk scene uh, right here. And um, of course there's Prince. And then, you know, the most important um, element of the musical landscape of Minneapolis uh, was an old bus station that was built in the 1930s that was empty for much of the 1970s after being turned into a disco. And then on January 1st, 1980, uh, it became the center of, of rock music uh, in the city and that's First Avenue. And you know, I like to call it the, the house that, that Prince built because he uh, is its most, its most famous and most uh, uh, well-known performer but what Prince is able to do is to really demonstrate um, and make First Avenue an important location in the Minneapolis Sound because it's at First Avenue from the latter part of the 1970s all the way throughout the 1980s and really throughout his career that he puts on display sonically the, the Minneapolis Sound. It's rock, it's funk, it's rhythm and blues, um, you know, it's, it's folksy, it's punk elements. He really demonstrates uh, with, with great authority um, what Minneapolis brings to the table. And so this is really, you know, this project, um, you know, a lot of people like to say that um, Prince was a genius and just leave it there. And he was, I mean, it's, it's, I mean you know, Prince is among the most great, of the greatest composers ever. Stravinsky, Beethoven, Mr. Nelson, you know, they are all in the same uh, category. But what Prince had was he had a landscape, a musical landscape. He had an institution, the public school system, that helped to facilitate his musical awakening. And if Prince didn't have that, he still would have been a musician. He might not have been the Prince we know. He definitely would not have sounded the way that he sounds. But, you know, this project is really an attempt to demonstrate that even the genius of Prince needed a support system. And you know everybody's not going to be a genius like Prince, but what we do want to do is is to provide a support system. And the arts and humanities are a fundamental and foundational element of providing a useful support system for young people. And having that language, that universal language in the Minneapolis school system, and teaching children music, helped to cultivate the city's identity. It helped to provide a through line and a cultural practice that enabled for the people in the city to begin to speak to each other in ways that they otherwise would not have had. And music became that, that sonic practice, that, that way of engaging, that way of working through, you know, the difficult realities of being um, a developing and growing diverse city. Music provided a, a, a way of doing that. And it also gave rise to 
the greatest pop musician and one of the most important composers to ever walk the earth, Prince Rogers Nelson. And that's the, uh, that's the end of the, uh, the, the presentation. So I would like uh, to show you just, um, I'll take two minutes and do this. Uh, Liz, do I have two minutes? Okay, cool. I will take two minutes uh, and do this. Let me share. Um, okay, so share. Where's my full screen at? Share. I want this one. Hmm. Click. Click to. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. So, um, so I'm doing a um, a, a virtual a virtual reality of this, and what I'm going to show you is the landing page for when you like when you put the goggles on, you go to the site. This is the landing page. And then I'll go into one of the, I'll, I'll quickly go into one of the rooms so you can just get a feel and you know, we can talk a little bit about um, how it all works. So here's the, here's the a tour of the landing page. Rashad, I think we're still on the PowerPoint on my screen. Say that again? We're unfortunately still on the PowerPoint on my screen. I wonder if we can get you to reshare There we go. You got it? Yep. All right. All right, I'm just gonna go back just a little bit. Okay. It does a tour, but I'll, uh, I'll move it. So this is a 360 image. You know, you can look up there, you can look down there. Uh, it was negative two when I took the picture, so um, I think I'm sort of down there somewhere. Uh, and this, of course, is in front of, uh, you can't see, it is in front of First Avenue. Um, so, you, like all VR, you can click and go into a room, and here's the first room. The Minneapolis Sound has an unlikely beginning, a waterfall. The fall's power and the wonder it inspired drew people from different parts of the world. Parades of settlers and migrants from the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, the South, and Western Europe flocked there. Many came seeking fortune, work, and cheap land, while others came as refugees fleeing violence. Dakota and Ojibwe Indians are the original inhabitants of the land now known as Minneapolis. They lived there for centuries, some 12,000 years before Europeans came along. For them, the falls were a source of life. All that changed in April of 1680. That was when Father Louis Hennepin, a French priest, saw the waterfall. His writings on the falls ignited a chain reaction that radically changed the region. Over the next 200 years, Native Americans were pushed off the land by federal government and white settlers. Okay. Okay, can you all see, are you all seeing me or you see my screen? Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, there's, there's just a little, a little taste of the, uh, of the VR. So I have five rooms like that and each one of them has multiple points that you can go into. Uh, so the beta version is all um, one dimensional. The the full diversion with the bells and whistles will be three dimensional and I'll be recreating or uh, someone will be recreating parts of the city. Uh, there'll be interviews, there'll be more images, um, but this is uh, the beta ver version. So that's a quick demonstration and that's the end of my talk. And um, I look forward to hearing your thoughts and feedback and comments. Thank you. Everybody, I can see a couple of clapping icons, so I'll clap for everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, Rashad. I wish that I could have found a way to like share my video so you could have seen me clapping and like gasping at some of like the a waterfall moment was especially like <gasps> 
So thank you. <laughs> um, so if there are any questions, please pop them into chat or raise your hand. I see one hand raised now, so we'll um, we'll go ahead and unmute you. And this is perfect because the one I wanted to do was ask actually a student to ask the first question. I know we're a little, we're going to run a little bit over time, but I think if everyone wants to stick around, this is going to be a really good discussion. Oh, okay. Never mind. Sorry. So that was meant to be a clap. I agree. Yes. Clapping is important. Um, so if there are any questions, pop them into chat. Oh, Tori. Yes, I have a question. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to raise my hand, but I don't see it. Um, my question is, well, first of all, this was amazing. I'm so glad I came to this presentation because my mom loves prints and I just love to learn more about it. So that's right. so great. Um, but my question is, so like, I know that we can't recreate prints because he was amazing, but how do we create an environment for the future generation to have that inspiration and that fusion? That, that, that is the question. So fantastic question. Um, I, we, have to, um, we have to believe that the humanities uh, and, and training and learning, uh, things like music, are valuable. You know, they've been, they've been stripped out of schools uh, across the nation, public schools, you know, poor schools, schools of color all over the nation. Uh, even the great Minneapolis school system, uh, its music program has been eroded over the last two, three decades. It's not what it was in the, in the 80s and early 90s. Um, public investment in, in, uh, in the humanities and arts will create a context where we will see people the princes of the world really flourish. And, and you know, what, what, what was important about Prince is that he could read it, he could write it, and he could play it. And it, there, there's a value to electronic music and not having to do that. But what, what made Prince the kind of superstar is that, you know, he, he could hear it, and he could write it down. And when you can do that as a musician, it just changes the entire nature. You know, it's, it's like being able to paint with four colors and not knowing how to read and write music and learning how to read and write music and painting with four billion. It's, it's that kind of difference. So I would say public investment in um, music education and the arts. That's awesome, thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. We have a question in chat that I'll read, and this is from Nalabega. Okay. Given the move to online learning due to COVID-19, is there room for the humanities to create such all-around music and arts programs, and what would that look like? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so I think, yes, uh, the humanities can be done uh, online, and I think I, th I think the humanities can be more hybridized. And what I mean is that, you know, in, in against the backdrop of COVID-19, um, we might need to see some in-person work together on a smaller scale and, and having others, um, come in remotely. I would, I would prefer to see that as opposed to all online. Now, of course you can do it. Basically the, the VR thing I'm doing, it's, it's at this point, I'm going to give it away. Um, I'm going to put it up and, and you know, make it part of the book um, experience when people you know, read the book or hear about the book. Um, and it'll be all digital, right? It'll be all online. So I think those kinds of things can and should be done more, those kinds of historical projects, those kind of academic projects should be done more um, in terms of the, the kind of foundational training around you know, dance and music. And I would, I would like to see more hybrids. So you know, maybe two pupils in one day, the other 15 or 20 um, you know, doing it remotely and finding some way to, to rotate that group so that everyone gets some opportunities, somewhat similar to what we're gonna do in the fall, I guess. Um, but yes, I think it can be done online. I think it would be better if it were hybrid. Good question. 
Thank you. And I'll pause for a minute in case someone's typing a question, but I have a, I definitely have a question. Okay. And okay, so maybe someone's still typing, but so I've been thinking a lot about how I think, and this just caused me to think even more about how human geography and digital humanities really seem to pair together really well, right? And this is a project that really like hit me, even those, the maps that you show, right? Like in this presentation, like mapping and spatial humanities seems so important, maybe more important right now. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit maybe about like, for, for people that are thinking right now about how the digital or digital humanities can enhance or complement the more traditional writing that they're doing, like how that happened for you. So I, uh, I fell into geography toward the end of my, toward the end of my period in graduate school. I didn't go to graduate school for geography. I went to graduate school in this humanities program called History of Consciousness. And, and I developed a kind of spatial pro program as a result of that. What, what geography enabled me to do is it enabled me to locate a phenomenon somewhere and then to be attentive to that location and that, lo that location's uh, how it impacted or shaped that phenomenon. And that's what made me a geographer. I, I didn't, I was not um, consciously interested in being a geographer. It, it really just kind of happened. And by being interested in the where, then I developed this thirst for trying to understand the where. And that really made geography um, so useful. And now, you know, I've been doing it for so long, it's kind of, you know, it's like second nature. Um, I'm always thinking spatially, but what it, what it, what it enables as a researcher is that it enables me to tell stories about people, histories, phenomena, to locate them somewhere, to use visuals to locate them, right? The, the, the maps, like I have a ton of maps from this project. When the, when the full VR comes out, it's just like, I, I just have so many, like so many. But I have, but, but what the maps do is they allow us to, to feel like we have a sense of whatever it is that we're talking about, that it's being, that it's grounded. And that grounding, what, what I try to do is I try to use that location and to unearth the things that make that place that place and talk about the relationship of the phenomena and the kind of ecology, if you will, or the environment in that place. And um, that is how my, that's really how this project started. Uh, it's how it developed. Um, it, it's really even developed beyond, you know, at one point in time, I was really trying to focus in on the role of black musicians. And I'm, I'm very attentive to the role of black musicians, but the story of black musicians is incomplete without the story of you know, it's migratory patterns, it's public school policy, uh, it's shifting economy, it's racial politics. I mean, it's just, I couldn't tell the story. So it forced me to really sort of, you know, scale things out a little bit more. But, um, you know, I think the digital humanities and geography offers something unique uh, in terms of helping students and the lay public to, to understand how any kind of phenomenon gets rooted somewhere and why it's rooted there. You know, why there are poor people here, you know, why Prince came from that place, you know, why hip hop was born in the Bronx, why jazz came from, you know, New Orleans. You know, this, this, these weren't just like, you know, just spontaneous, combustion, it was a sedimented process of all of these things happening. I mean, to think that the Minneapolis Sound started because of the waterfall, <laughs> you know, like a geological shift, you know, and then people settled there and then this guy comes across it and then all of a sudden there's this massive groundswell of people into that place. And that starts the whole process of, you know, Thaddeus Paul Giddings who launches this project 
and then Prince gets born in there. You know, it just, I like, who would ever think of something like that? But that's, that's really what happens. And, you know, we can, that same story can be told for, you know, why we're all in Arizona right now, or, you know, we get, you know, uh, so many of those kinds of stories. So, so yeah, that's, that's why I think, um, I think the digital humanities and geography offers something really um, unique and why it's um, important in this moment. Thank you, and I have to read Nella Vega's um, comment, which is how they're rooted, but also how they get uprooted. That's right. That's right. Right. How they how they how they get rooted and uprooted. Right. And the and the and the processes that have to happen to root people a certain place and to uproot. All right. And so, so you know, part of the story is the reason why so many Scandinavians came is. In, in parts of Scandinavia, there was a um, there was a nativist <laughs> very so so telling this. There was a nativist movement by all of these nationalists, and they thought the people in the city were not real Scandinavians. They're, they're not real Icelandic or you know real uh, Swedes or or um, you know Norwegians. And and because the epicenter of culture and, pol and politically and economically were those cities. The people in the rural landscape, they left and came to, a, came to Minnesota because there was this belief it looked like parts of Scandinavia. And then an economic downturn happened, and then all those people in the city who those, those folks in the rural part were trying to get away from, they moved too because now there have been this pipeline. And that's why you got all those Scandinavians. Right, these sort of you know random, <laughs> you know, it's just really random a lot of times. But that randomness, it creates this really interesting pattern, and you know the mini, the music of Minneapolis and Prince really emerge um, out of that. Thank you, guys. I don't see any raised hands, and I think we might. I wish I could kind of go through and have like you have to read the whole chat, Rushad. Like yeah, it's yeah. really like when, even when you were presenting, it was really yeah. We were reacting, so it was really fantastic. Okay. Um, so I think you know we're about ten minutes over, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and just thank you so much, Rashad, for for this presentation. Um, this was the second digital humanities you know virtual hour, and I think that this was the perfect time for this presentation. So thank you. Wow. And so I'll clap, and if anyone wants to unmute and clap with me. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I will see you all around.